Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to... Oh, is that good? Is that too loud? <laughs> Sorry for the surprise there. Uh, welcome to the Passwords Contract. Um, this talk, we're going to have The Attacker's Guide to Exploiting Secrets by Mackenzie Jackson. Uh, before we begin, just want to quickly thank our sponsors. That is our diamond sponsor, Adobe, and our gold sponsors, Prisma Cloud, Semgrep, Blue Cat, Plextrack, Toyota, and Conductor One. They make this all possible, so thanks to them. Uh, this talk is going to be filmed, live streamed, and uploaded to YouTube afterwards. This means that we'd prefer if you just keep your phones silent or as silent as possible. Uh, no need to film it or anything. We'll have all that taken care of. Uh, and that also means if you have a question, uh, please wait for someone to bring a mic around. Uh, raise your hand. We'll bring one to you. That way your question can also be recorded for posterity's sake so the entire internet can, uh, can know what you were asking. Um, without further ado then, Mackenzie Jackson, take it away. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. It's great to be here. Uh, this is my, my second talk here. Uh, so really, really happy to be presenting at B-Sides for all you lovely folks. I, was kinda, I wasn't sure if anyone was going to come. I thought most people might be at the bar, but I'm really, I'm really pleased to see uh, a few faces here. So thanks for, thanks for making it out. Quickly, a little bit about me. So I'm from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, I live in the Netherlands now. I'm an advocate. I'm a, a, a security and developer advocate for a French company called Git Guardian. Uh, you can find me anywhere on social media at the handle at Advocate Mac. I'm also the host of a podcast called The Security Repo. My mum is my mum's favorite podcast. She recommends it to everyone. So uh, it would be great to have more than one person listen to it. Uh, if, you, if you want, you can find it on the QR code, scan at your own risk. I promise I won't do anything malicious, but you never know. <laughs> um, OK, so this is, talk is going to be a little bit different. For me, it's about 50% slides and then about 50% live demos. I have no idea why I decided that was going to be a good idea when I submitted this, but I'm committed. I'm up here now. So let's do it. So with that in mind, if we can all take a moment to pray to the demo gods that everything's going to work uh, well for me here. Uh, so first of all, uh, was anyone at my previous talk? Uh, a couple of people? All right, there's going to be a tiny bit of overlap at the end. Uh, but I always like to start with just what, we, uh, what we're talking about when we're talking about secrets. So a secret is a digital authentication credential. So these are typically things like API keys, security certificates, uh, that type. And the idea is that these are made to be used programmatically, not by humans. So that's why they often end up in places they shouldn't, because humans touch them. Uh, they put them inside their source code. And that ends up in our applications and our code repositories. So this presentation is going to look at various ways that we can exploit secrets in different technologies. Each one of the, the exploits I'm going to talk about is accompanied by research and then a real life breach and uh, a, a demo of how it works in practice. So that's how the situation is going to kind of unfold. I'll talk through some research of it. I'll show how it actually works in the wild, and then we'll have a look at how we can actually do it uh, on the tools ourselves. Uh, all the demonstrations I think I've kind of put at the level of script kitty. Uh, so anyone here that's script kitty and above can definitely perform these attacks. Uh, but you know, again, don't do anything malicious uh, with the information here. So secrets, they are everywhere. Uh, we can find them in all kinds of wacky and weird places. The more that you start looking for them, the more that you realize you know, just how frequent of a problem it is. And this is really known by attackers at the moment. And when we look at a lot of the attacks that we have, secrets are probably used in just about all of them in varying ways. Now, that might be the attacker's initial access. They might have found this secret or purchased it somewhere, and that's how they broke into the systems. Or it might be something that they've used later on as a way to elevate their privileges after they've already found their way in. So they're used in, in lots of different ways. And why they're so valuable is because you know, when an attacker, when, when we break into a system, you know, we have, uh, there's a saying that I hate called attacker only has to be right once. It's wrong because uh, anyone that's kind of done some penetration testing knows that you have to be right multiple times to be able to get anywhere. Um, and secrets are great because they allow us to persist our access without being detected. We can correctly authenticate ourselves. We can elevate our privileges. Uh, so these are kind of the gold standard. The first thing that I look for whenever going into a system, uh, when I have my black hat on, is to try and find these secrets to be able to maintain my control. 
So the first one here I want to talk about is, uh, is kind of abusing the, the GitHub API to be able to find these secrets uh, and, and how we do that. So we're probably all familiar with this website, GitHub. It's the largest uh, collection of source code in the world. And if we look at some stats of how big it is, this is last year. All of these stats is just, I'm just talking about public uh, repositories. I'm not talking about private repositories. So about a billion commits were made to GitHub last year. So a billion contributions of code. 94 million developers are uh, using GitHub, according to GitHub themselves. And last year, there was about 85 million uh, public code repositories that were created. So this is a huge amount of source code that we can sift through. And a lot of this is intentionally public. There's a lot of open source stuff on here. But a lot of it is actually code that wasn't meant to be public. Um, and you can find a whole bunch of really juicy information on here uh, in your reconnaissance phase if you're looking at public activity on GitHub. So some research that we did at GitGuardian, we scanned all of GitHub, uh, every, all public activity for an entire year, and we discovered 10 million secrets uh, on there. Uh, so these are huge. So we can actually have a look at some of the secrets that we have. You know, data storage, about 25%, so 2.5 million uh, credentials that give us access to databases and data. Cloud providers, 20%. That equates to about 2 million cloud provider keys that were leaked publicly on GitHub repositories last year. Now, cloud provider keys are great too because you know, we can validate these automatically. So we're not talking about 2 million keys that look like cloud provider keys. We're talking about 2 million valid cloud provider keys that we found uh, last year. So if you're paying for a cloud service, you're stupid. You should just look on GitHub. Um, no, don't do that. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Other things we are do, you know, lots of messaging systems. These are really interesting as well. I can talk about that a little more. So there's lots of great stuff that we actually, uh, well, great depending on who you're looking at. There's lots of interesting stuff. This is, and again, this is all just public. Uh, and if we look at kind of the types of keys that we found, you know, Google API keys are really the number one. But you can get down, you get lots of, there's a really long list of credentials, thousands of different types of credentials. You know, but when we look at these, we find huge amounts of them um, that can actually do stuff. You know, three, three, almost 4% of the secrets that we found were GitHub access tokens. So someone's put their access token for their private repositories in their public repository. Um, so you know, that's a very interesting way to do it. Uh, so it, it definitely can happen in there. So let's talk about exactly how we can start to abuse this public information. So the first, the first way, I, I don't really like this way, but it's the most obvious and easiest, so I'll just talk about it briefly. And this is using the search feature in Google to be able to find credentials. So here we're looking for a file name called credentials, good place to start, an AWS access key. Um, and there's lots of different types of these dorks. GitHub dorking that you can do. Now, amazingly, you will actually find credentials this way, but it's very labor intensive. And it's not that great because uh, most of the secrets that you will actually find are in history on development branches. Uh, so this way isn't, isn't that great. There's a much better way to do this uh, if you're like me and lazy, and that's using the GitHub uh, API, the public API. Uh, so I'll show you this in a minute. This is, this is a, a, an address that anyone can go to. Anyone can go to this, uh, this thing. You don't need authentication. And this is a ledger of everything that happens on GitHub publicly. So it's very easy to monitor. So when, when, I, when I say to people that things are public, everyone understands that if I know the address, if I know the URL or you, you, your username or repository name, I can find that on GitHub. That's what public means. But it's also broadcast on this API. So it's very easy for an attacker to monitor this. Now, there's lots and lots of non-malicious reasons why this is good. And there's lots of services that use this um, in legitimate ways. But it's great for an attacker as well. So there's a couple of events that we really want to look out for. The public event, this is the most interesting. This is when a private repository is made public. So this is when you make a repository public, you make all your history public with it. So a year ago, if someone committed uh, an API key on a developer branch, and now you've decided to make that uh, repository public, that's still there, hidden away. And the other one is a push event. So let's take a quick look uh, oh, wrong way. at this here. So this is the, 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 the event itself. Um, now, GitHub is a fire hose of data. So as an attacker, this is kind of almost too much to digest, especially if you're trying to look for specific targets. So we actually get lots of information in here as well, including uh, the, the email of the committers. So you can look for specific company domain names if you want to, if you're targeting that. So you might have uh, employees that work for those, those companies that are committing uh, information publicly. And then once you kind of have 
as, as someone that's committed with a company's domain, you can keep track of that uh, of that user. And then if they commit on any other email address, you can also monitor that. So there's lots of ways of you can sift through the information of this to try and make it a little bit more, more relevant. But what I actually want to do now is I kind of want to do the, the, the worst thing that anyone can do. And I would today uh, are going to leak some keys on the GitHub uh, uh, public API because I want to show you what's happening. So I have here some honey tokens. So uh, honey tokens are fake credentials. Uh, that uh, essentially are a trap for an attacker. So here we have uh, some AWS access credentials. This is really the, the top level that an attacker is going to want. These are very, very juicy and very interesting. Uh, so cloud provider keys. And what I'm going to do is I have this GitHub user here called Leaky McGee. He's a really bad developer, has all kinds of bad uh, practices. I'm going to create a configuration file. I'm going to paste my keys in here, and we're going to commit these uh, to the public Git repository. So the, the reason why I'm doing this is I want to show you how quickly these keys are going to be exploited. So if I go back to my dashboard, uh, what I can actually see is I can see uh, who's going to try and use these keys. Every time an attacker tries to use these, every time someone tries to use these, I'm going to get their IP address, where they're calling from, what, uh, what API calls they're using on my keys, uh, so we can actually see how often and how frequent an attacker is going to be used to these. So I just created this. It might be a little bit too soon. All right, there's no, uh, there's no things here, but we're going to come back to this uh, a little bit later on, and I want to show you how many people have tried to exploit it, exploit these keys, uh, just when I'm in talking. So what's actually happening who are the attackers that are looking for these and how can you use it? It's quite interesting because there's different groups of attackers. So firstly, uh, there's so much information on GitHub, finding an AWS credential for a specific target is quite challenging. So what often happens is you have attackers that are very good at harvesting. So looking through these huge, vast amounts of data, like on GitHub, harvesting all the credentials, and then they sell them to another group of attackers who is really good at specializing and exploiting them. So I'll get a lot of traffic on my Honey token today and over the next week. Then it will calm down, and then I'll get traffic again, because that credential will undoubtedly be packaged up in a group of valid credentials that will be sold to attackers to exploit. So that's typically how this uh, situation uh, really, really works. So is there any examples of where leaked keys publicly have actually uh, made an impact or attackers have found them? So there's, there's actually quite a lot of examples of this. Uh, there's one here that's uh, quite interesting. It's uh, Toyota who leaked these keys themsel uh, themselves. So Toyota, obviously a car manufacturer. They have a mobile application called T-Connect. Now, they didn't manufacture this mobile application by themselves. They used a contractor. That contractor accidentally pushed some of that source code to a public repository uh, in 2017. And they remained there for five years before someone actually found them. Now, these hard-coded credentials gave access to the database of all the users using T-Connect. So as an attacker, this is, this is gold for me, because not only do I have these email addresses and personal information from people, I also know that they own a Toyota. I also know that they're using this mobile application. So if I wanted to conduct a phishing campaign, I have a lot of great information that I can use to target that. So this is an example of when leaked keys were actually used by an attacker. Let's go back to an example here. And we can already see that two people in India have already tried to use my AWS key. Uh, so this is what we, <laughs> uh, so this is, we can see there, or one person actually, it's the same IP address. Uh, so we can see that they're using Travelhog. This is an open source credential finder. Uh, this is the call that they've made, get caller identity. This is the lowest level call that you can, you can make. So this is the reason why they're using this call is because they want to just check if these keys are valid, but they don't want to create any suspicion around, uh, around someone actually having these. What will happen is you'll start seeing later on different types of calls we made, such as you know, trying to apply policies, trying to create other users, because then they're going to try and find out and, and it, very quickly what type, what type of access this key has. So it doesn't take very long. We'll take a look at the end of the session and see how many other people uh, have tried to exploit that. We can all take uh, bets on how many, <laughs> how many we think. All right, so I want to uh, talk about uh, something else now. So we've just talked about 
public uh, source code. So this is very interesting. There's lots and lots of great stuff on here. Uh, we can find really interesting credentials in public uh, source code. But if we're specifically trying to target a certain person, a certain group, this may not be the easiest approach to take. It may not, we may not be able to gather any credentials uh, you know, for that. What's much better is trying to get access to private code repositories. So private code repositories, code is very, very leaky. This is just some of the examples of some source codes that have leaked uh, recently. Uh, there's been massive ones like Twitch's entire source code, 6,000 repositories were, were, were leaked. Uh, and some massive companies that I would consider have a great security posture, like Microsoft, like Samsung. Uh, so this is a much more interesting way because source code, whilst it's actually really sensitive, um, and it is a treasure trove for secrets, especially in the history. I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Um, but it's, it's actually very leaky. You think about all the developers that have access to, the, to it, you think about all the places it's backed up, it's shared in wikis, it's in Jira tickets, it's in uh, Slack messages. So we can really leverage the fact that source code is going to end up in lots of places to try and gain access to it. And uh, this here is, a, is, is some interesting. So in our research at Geek Guardian, we work with lots of companies to secure their secrets. And typically what we'll find is in an average company that we work with, they have about 400 developers. And with that, if they're, if they're, if they're on the upper end, they'll have about four AppSec engineers. The developer average is about 100 developers per one AppSec engineer. I think it's a little bit less, um, but you know, that's what that's what it tells us. So if we do some maths, when we scan for that, we're going to find uh, 3,400 credentials, typically. That's what we typically find when we do our initial scans of a company this site in their private source code repositories. Now, we actually averages, averages out, it's, it's actually 13,000 total secrets that we find, and 3,000 of them are unique. So if we take that number 13,000, we have four AppSec engineers, that, that means that they have to sift through all of that information, and even in just the 3,000, they have to sift through all that information, and what they have to do, they have to investigate with the developer, if this is a real credential, they have to rotate it without creating any downtime, and they have to redeploy again, without creating any downtime. So this, was, this is a massive problem, and that's why they're there, because it's actually very, very hard to solve. So how do we get a, oh, first I'll talk about t uh, some Twitch. So let's have a, a real life example of a breach. So Twitch had their source code exposed. It was due to a misconfiguration. Very briefly, Twitch's source code was publicly accessible. Uh, bad guys are very, uh, are very trustworthy when it comes to being able to find this stuff very quickly. So someone found it, and then they leaked it in a torrent. So there were 6,000 repositories that were leaked. We scanned these, and we found over 6,000 secrets. Now, that seems like a lot, but actually, this is really good. Twitch was actually doing a good job. To only have 6,000 secrets in their source code repositories is probably better than what we'd expect. There was 194 AWS keys in there, and, and lots of other things, including Stripe keys and GitHub OAuth credentials. So it's really interesting what we can find in there. So that leads us to the question, all right, if we can make our way into the private source code, that's great, but we have to first do that. So how do we actually get into our private source code? So there's a couple of ways. I'm only going to go through one of them in the demo. But the first one, uh, the first two are not very exciting, but they are pretty standard. So first one is buying access. This happens a lot. A lot of those source codes that were leaked were leaked from a group called Lapsus. It was a bunch of teenagers, um, and they managed to get access into Microsoft, NVIDIA, Samsung source code. So how did a group of teenagers break into these companies with such fantastic security posture? They posted in Telegram, and they said, hey, we'll give you money if you, if you give us access. So not very hackery, but it works. It still happens, and it's a, it's a viable way of actually getting in. The other way is phishing. The recent one is the Chrome extension. They really were targeting uh, developers in this uh, for Chrome extension developers uh, to try and gain their credentials uh, to, to try and be able to move into to different areas. Exploiting misconfigurations in Git. This one's quite exciting and the one that I prefer. And the last one, which is very difficult, is supply chain attack. So I'm going to talk about the CodeCov supply chain attack. But basically, CodeCov is a tool that was compromised. The attacker's goal was only to get into the, the private source code repositories uh, of certain companies. 
So when we talk about misconfigurations, what's a misconfiguration in Git that we can exploit? Well, there's one that's very, very common, and that's having expose.git directories. So when you go git init, if you're used to coding, it's going to create a folder called .git, a directory called .git. In this .git folder is all your history, all your metadata of everything that happens. It's actually really, really sensitive. Um, and what can happen is this often, just this folder finds its way out onto publicly, publicly accessible places. If we can find this folder, we can go back and we can restructure it to get back to the original Git repository. This is really, really useful for us because we've got all that history in there and it's really easy to do. Cyber News did some research. They did lots of scanning and they actually found 2 million of these .git directories that were publicly exposed. So this is actually happens everywhere. So let's have a look at exactly uh, how we can go about finding this. So there's a couple of steps that we need to take. Uh, to be able to do this. So the first one is that we need to be able to understand if we have a target, we need to understand, hey, what are all the subdomains that they have? What are all the domains that they have where this folder might actually be located? So there's a really cool tool. Now, I've been told that I'm not allowed to expose any real vulnerabilities in this talk, so I'm not going to. I'm going to behave. Um, I'm just going to use an example. But there's a tool. I like to use two tools to do this, Chaos and Subfinder. I'm just going to demo Subfinder. This is a very easy. What I do is now I'm looking for all the subdomains that relate to Hacker1. I'm using Hacker1 because I know that there's no vulnerability, so I'm going to unintentionally uh, discover. And in a minute, hopefully, do I still have my internet? Yeah. Uh, and in a minute, so this is now looking for it, and in a minute it's going to spit out a list of all the subdomains that it's been able to find that relate to Hacker1. And what I'm going to do is I'm then going to use that list to be able to, um, here we are, I'm now going to use this list and I'm going to look in all of these to try and find if there's any uh, exposed .git directories. Now, this is a very small list. Usually, it would be a very, very large list in companies uh, that we're looking for. Uh, but it doesn't matter. So I'm going to use a tool here called Git Scanner. Uh, so I'm going to use Git Scanner. And what this does is this scans this list for me, and it tries to find these exposed.git directories, and then it will dump them into my folder if it finds any. So I have this Hacker1 list. Uh, so I'm just going to scan them. Oh, sorry. So what this is doing is now it's going to look and it's going to check to see if there's any Git, uh, exposed Git directories. Now, a lot of these are saying non-vulnerable. Non um, again, I didn't want to show any that were vulnerable. It comes up green when it finds one. And it's very, very frequent that it does find one. And you'll see here that says maybe vulnerable. What this means is that there is actually a .git directory there, but it's not uh, publicly accessible. But if you want to, you can go further on that and you can actually try and find, because quite often the folder is not accessible, but you can find individual files from that. So it's worth doing further exploration, even if it comes back that you don't have permission for it. Often, the, very frequently, they're misconfigured and you, can, and you can see it. So then once we, have our, um, once we have our Git directory, what we need to do then is we need to extract that information. So I here have a folder where I have a .git directory here that's been, that I've, I've discovered. But when you click on this, there's no source code. It just comes up with areas like Git hooks. So we need to be able to convert this back to a point where we can access the code. I can use the same tool for that with the extractor functionality. And I just put in the area that my, my folder is at. And then I want to put where I want to output it to. This is going to take just a small minute. This is going into that .git directory, and it's converting it back into a proper git folder with all of its source code that I can then use and find. So now we have this extracted folder, and you'll see in here we've gone back to the original source code. So this is how we can often find access to it. Now, once we have access to the source code, it's very easy to discover secrets in there. We can use lots of different credential scanners. I could almost guarantee that there will be secrets buried in the history here. So this is a great way of being able to access that private source code that's going to contain a trove of sensitive information for us. So if you want to know, there's the tools that I used. Chaos and Subfinder are great ways to find subdomains, uh, extract them. Uh, 
I use git scanner to find the .git directories and extract them, dump them and extract them. Uh, and then I will scan them with a tool called ggshield to find uh, secrets. So that's one way that we can kind of get into the, the private code repository. If you want to explore more ways of how you can abuse misconfigurations in Git, there's a great tool called gitgoat. And this is basically uh, 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 a Git repository that has lots of different misconfigurations with instructions on how to do it. And what you'll actually find is a lot of these misconfigurations that are in gitgoat are out there in the wild uh, that you can exploit. So there's lots of different explo exploitations methods and using misconfigurations to get into different areas of source code. So why? Why on earth are secrets in source code so much? I'm going to move on to other areas now, finding them inside applications and running applications. But why is source code such a problem? So the, the number one way is that we find source code in the history, uh, uh, the, we find secrets in the history of source code. So this is an example. If you're used to coding, you're probably familiar with this. This is a Git, uh, just a Git branch. And what we have is we have our main branch. This is kind of what we would deploy. And then when people are working on different features, we often create feature branches for them that are kind of separate. What a developer will often do is get a credential, hard code it into their feature branch, thinking no one's going to find it. They will then remove that because they know that that's not what's meant to happen, but they were just quickly doing it. And then that gets merged, and no one actually knows that there's a secret in there. That secret will exist for the entire life of that Git repository, unless you rewrite the history, which is a total pain. I wouldn't recommend it. But basically, that's why secrets so frequently in there. When we're writing source code, everything we do is tracked. Everything we do, we keep a record of. So we make a mistake. One of our employees, one of our developers make a mistake, even just for a minute, and that can come back and bite us in a day when people like me are trying to get into their private source code. There's lots of other ways that they end up in code, in auto-generated files and in logs. If you have a debug log, uh, you might have a printout of your environment variables. These very frequently contain secrets as well. Uh, not having any git ignore files, having secrets.txt, we see this a lot. You know, uh, sometimes that we create them in templates, like if you have a, a Django project, it will create a key for you. You have to actively go in and remove that key uh, and put it somewhere safe. A lot of people don't. Um, and then we also see that people are just sharing secrets uh, in source code. So lots of ways in why secrets end up in source code. And there's lots of ways to be able to exploit this as an attacker, both publicly and privately. All right, so I want to move on to the next part, which is Docker images. I couldn't decide if I wanted to do Docker images or packages, uh, you know, exploiting package managers, but I thought Docker was told a more interesting story, so I've, I'm going down on this path. So uh, if you're not familiar with what a Docker image is, a Docker image is like a mini virtual machine. If we want to run an application, that application needs lots of other things to work. So Docker packages that, that all up so that your application should run in any environment. Docker Hub is where we store these Docker images. So lots of companies store their Docker images on Docker Hub. You can download it, and that's how you use that application. Uh, there's millions and millions, there's tens of millions of public Docker images uh, on here. Uh, and yeah, there's, there's, there's a huge amount of uh, information. Now, th these should be public, because if you have a public application, you want people to be able to use it. So there's no problem of having a Docker image public. But we started looking into discovering how many of these Docker images will actually have secrets inside of them. So we found that nearly 5% of Docker images contain at least one hard-coded secret. So 5%. So if you download, it doesn't take you very long to be able to find something interesting in here. You download you know, 10, 10 Docker images, you're going to find a couple of, uh, you know, 100 Docker images, you're going to find a couple of secrets. So, and that doesn't take very long to be able to exploit this. So why, why do we have secrets inside Docker images? There's a, a couple of reasons of what it is. But essentially, a Docker image is an application. What is an application? It's just your source code. Now, it's been transformed into a, a, a version that's non-human readable, but that doesn't mean that I can't extract the source code from it. So what I want to do is I just want to talk about an attack that uses that used a Docker image. And this one's interesting because it relates back to private source code as well. So there's a, a, a tool called CodeCov. It's a code coverage tool. Um, it sits in your CI CD pipeline. Doesn't matter if you're not understanding what all that is. But basically what this tool does is it tested how much of your application was being tested. It did a very specific thing and you'd put it in your environment and it, you wouldn't be too worried about it. How people used this product was that they downloaded their publicly accessible Docker image to be able to, to use it. Inside that Docker image, there was a hard-coded uh, hard credential uh, in, in plain text. 
attack has actually found this hard-coded credential. What did this credential do? It allowed them to be able to tamper with the source code that Docker had. So there was a, a, a specifically a bash uploader script. They turned this, they turned CodeCov, the tool, malicious. And at the time, it affected 20,000 of CodeCov's customers. So what did their malicious tampering actually do? What CodeCov, uh, what the attackers did, was they injected one line of source code that said, every time you run CodeCov, I want you to take a dump of all the environment variables, and I want you to send them to me at my remote address as the attacker. So anytime one of these 20,000 targets used CodeCov, the attacker got a bunch of secrets from it. Now, a lot of those secrets hopefully were test credentials or for test environments, so it didn't affect production. But the attackers weren't after those credentials. They were actually after one specific credential. They were after the credentials for private source code repositories. So the attackers then moved from CodeCov into the private source code of lots of different companies, and this included uh, uh, HashiCorp, Monday.com, Rapid7, Twilio. They all uh, had breaches because the attackers made it into their source code, and there were secrets inside their source code. So this is just an example of really you know, how, this can, you know, how this can happen. A secret in a Docker image means that you can get into the private source code. So this was the example of a supply chain attack. This is quite sophisticated, um, but finding the secret in Docker really isn't. Now, I don't like to pick on companies normally ever uh, about breaches, but I'm going to pick on one, and that's HashiCorp, because HashiCorp had a, had a breach because of this. And if you don't know what HashiCorp is, HashiCorp creates a very cool product called Vault. It's probably the best secrets manager on the market. I actually really like HashiCorp. I don't think they'll ever give me a job now, but, um, <laughs> but I'm a big fan. But uh, what actually happened was HashiCorp created, created the term secrets for all. HashiCorp said, created Vault to say, with Vault, you no longer have to give developers access to your secrets. You never have to worry about secrets for all if you're effectively using Vault. HashiCorp had to announce that they had a private key in their source code because of this breach. So if HashiCorp has secrets in their repositories, there's absolutely no hope for anyone else. Um, all right, so let's have a look into, uh, into uh, Docker. So the first thing I want to actually do is take a look at what is a Docker image. So one of the problems of why this, uh, this all happens is we don't understand the technologies often uh, intimately that we're using. So when we create a Docker image, all right, we can't open that with anything else. We can't access the source code from that easily. So we just assume that it's all secure and you can't break it down. This is what a Docker image looks like on the inside. This is a tool called Dive. I'll explain what, what we're kind of looking at. So on the, on the left where my, where my key's going up and down, these are layers. When you create a Docker image, you do it in layers. So you can add a file and remove it throughout the process. And if we go down, we'll see a bunch of green. So the green is what has been added. So if we have a look at this uh, in this application, sorry. We can actually see that there's a bunch of, uh, a bunch of source code in here that, we, uh, that we've added in. So we can see a lot of Python projects. So this is the source code of our application. This source code is inside our Docker image. So if there's source code in our Docker image and there's secrets in our source code, we can extract it easily from this Docker image. And we don't even need to extract it. We can just use tools to be able to scan it. So here, I'm just going to use a tool. Uh, called ggshield. Now, again, I'm not allowed to, sh to show uh, real life vulnerabilities, so I'm scanning a Docker image that contains fake secrets. But what I'm doing is I'm using this tool called ggshield. I'm just saying, hey, I want you to scan this Docker image. It's going to download that Docker image for me. It's going to scan it, and it's going to let me know if it finds any secrets inside here. So when I said that 5% of Docker images contain, uh, contain a secret. So if you do this 100 times, you're going to find about five secrets, uh, five real secrets. And this is how quickly. You can easily do this 100 times by the time I finish my presentation. And here we can see we have some secrets. Again, these aren't real. Um, these are just example secrets. But we have some API keys. We have some bearer images. We have some username and passwords. And these are typical things that we find inside Docker images. Really easy to, to extract this information uh, if we need to. So, I really like to harm on the point that non-human readable does not mean secure. Uh, I just want to talk about one other thing. So why, why does this happen? So again, it's kind of not understanding the technologies that we have. Uh, if you're not familiar with Docker, this will look like mumble jumble. But I'll explain what's happening is when I said that Docker creates is built up in layers, we have here an example that I've found quite regularly, which is concerning. 
So we have, well basically what's happening is they're adding a file into this Docker image while they're building it. The file is called netrc. That netrc contains credentials that's used to connect to a package manager. And then what they're doing at the very end, they're removing that netrc. And they're doing this because they think, hey, this is a sensitive file, I'm going to use it and then I'm going to get rid of it and move on with my life. Not realizing that Docker is built up in layers, I can still get that file from your original Docker image. So this is another reason why, kind of why this happens. So again, really easy way to be able to find and exploit credentials, not very difficult, and there's lots and lots of them out there. All right, I'm going to talk about the, the last one here, which is mobile applications. Now, I did a whole talk with this before. If you were at that talk, I apologize. The next couple of slides are going to be uh, the same, but uh, for the purposes of other people, I'll, I'll still go through it. So here, this is something you might see on the Play Store, or on the App Store, depending on what you use. This is a mobile application. So what is a mobile application? Uh, again, they're non-human readable, so that means that they're secure, right? Again, no, it does not. So there's two types of files that are going to be on depending on what operating system you're using. If we build a, a, a mobile application, it's going to be an IPA if it's on Apple, and it's going to be an APK if it's on Android. What are these files? These are glorified zip folders, especially the Apple one, and I'll explain why. Um, so let's go into a quick, a quick demo of, of what we have here. So here I have two... Uh, here I have two applications. This is my iOS app.ipa, my Android app.apk. And what I'm going to do, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, am I in the right? Yeah. Uh, is I'm going to decompile the Android application. So I'm using a tool called JDAX. Uh, and basically, this is going to convert that APK back into a version where I can read. Now, it's very easy to download these APKs. You can do it through a mirror. Um, you, so there's, there's no way you can download any files that you want. And in a minute, this is going to give me some source code uh, that I'm going to be able to look through. Now, for the iOS application, much more difficult. I made this joke at the last time too, so I apologize. You're hearing all my jokes twice. But all we need to do to extract source code from uh, iOS application is change the extension to .zip. So then we go use .zip. We extract it. We give it a minute. Now we have our payload. Now this has an app inside of it. And all we need to do is remove this. And now we have our source code for our iOS application. If there's secrets inside here, inside that, they're very easy to find. And also, our Android application has finished. So now we have uh, our source code for our Android application as well. Now, we can look through this uh, if we want to try and find these secrets manually. That's a very, very uh, long process. So instead, what we can do is we can just be lazy, because that's what attackers often do. And we're going to just scan this. So right now, I'm using GD Shield again to scan uh, the path where I exploited my Android application to. We're going to go ahead and do that. It's going to take a, a little bit of time. Um, because we're scanning 21,000 files. Um, and we'll come back in, in just a minute. Uh, we'll come back and we can have a look at the secrets that we've found in here. So right at the moment, it's getting some errors because there's a lot of media files in here that it's getting stuck on. But we'll come back in just a second. So if we think that our mobile applications are secure and that people can't reverse them, we can. So this leads you to the questions. Uh, how worthwhile is it as an attacker to try and find uh, secrets inside mobile applications? Spoiler alert, very worthwhile. So if you're interested in the tools and the workflow that, I'm, that I use to do this, here we have a tool called GPlay Downloader. This is how I downloaded the tools. I decompiled it with JDEX. Again, this is just for Android. And I scanned it with GG Shield. So this is the workflow that I used. This is at the level of a script kitty, right? Anyone can really do this. Um, and then for Apple, much simpler. I use a tool called IPA tool to download it. You just change the extension, and then you can scan it with GG Shield. Uh, so if I quickly go back, still, still detecting. Uh, so now let's just go and do a, an actual uh, example of a breach. This example is from Jason Haddock. He's a legend. Uh, he was very kind enough to come on my podcast. My mum really enjoyed that episode. Um, and uh, he talked us through an exploit that he did when he was hacking into doing some penetration tests of a bank where he found secrets. So this bank, which was a tier one bank in the States, uh, 
it was uh, was being was being obviously it's being used by the bank's customers. So Jason was taking a look at that. He decompiled it. He noticed that some of the functionality of the bank was that you could take pictures of checks um, and cash those checks. He found out that those images were not being stored uh, as encrypted on the device. And then he was curious as to where these images were being stored. They were being sent to an Amazon S3 bucket, and inside the application was the key for that Amazon S3 bucket that was hard coded. So then he could access that Amazon S3 bucket and found 10,000 images of uh, unencrypted images of checks. So you know this is from this is this is this is a, a financial institution that's hard coded secrets in their mobile applications, um, just because people don't think that we can extract them. All right, now we've finished scanning, and as you can see, we've got a lot of secrets in here. Now this one, I've hidden the secrets, but this is a real example. This is a real app that I got from the, the Play Store. I've hidden its name. Um, you don't have to look too hard, but we can have a look at what we've found. Uh, we've found some Google API keys that are valid, so, we, so this is quite serious. There's some Slack webhooks that are valid. I love these because it means I can do internal phishing campaigns and post in there. And there's also uh, some Google OAuth keys as well, so the, and Facebook keys. These are all hard-coded into the application. Uh, this isn't that un uh, abnormal. Um, so you want to wonder how many applications actually contain hard-coded secrets? How many? Well, we don't need to wonder because our friends at Cyber News did some great research on this, and they found that about 56% of applications contained, contained hard-coded secrets. Now, I like to stress here that that doesn't mean that 56% of applications have hard-coded secrets that you could easily use as an attacker. There are keys in there, like Firebase keys, which wouldn't allow you to do anything malicious unless they had misconfigured their Firebase account, which regularly happens. But there is lots of secrets on there that are very interesting as well. And as an attacker, I'm still interested in the keys that I, that I can't use. It's a piece of the puzzle. That means that if I get another level of access or I can do something else, I might be able to use that key in a way. So they're still sensitive even if I can't use them immediately. The keys that we found, the number one key was uh, Google storage buckets. So this kind of relates back to the example that Jason gave us of having storage keys in there. The reason why I assume this is so problem is it seems to make more sense to send an image or something directly to data from the app and not go through your back end. But that's a terrible idea because that means your keys are in your app. So lots of really interesting stuff that we find in here. And the total amount of secrets that they found was 124,000. Um, and that was from 50,000 mobile applications. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you're wondering what to do on this weekend, that's a great way. All right, so I'm almost at the end. I have three minutes to go. I'm very happy. None of my demos failed, so I can relax now. I'm definitely going to the bar after this. Um, but the last part, I'm not going to talk too much about this. I'm just going to talk about it for three minutes. My colleague Dwayne did a talk that was, much, uh, that was in detail about you know, how to properly manage secrets. If you didn't go to that, you might want to have a look. But we'll have a look. The number one thing, don't hard code your API keys. Don't hard code your secrets even to test. If they're anywhere to find, I'm going to find them. If they're in, a, they might end up publicly. If they're in private source code repositories, we talked about lots of ways I can get access to those. So just don't hard code your secrets. Just because I can get into your uh, private source code shouldn't mean that I can pwn your organization or your applications. Um, and because source code is something that's very, very hard to secure based on how leaky it is. So we need to adopt the mindset of this should be considered open source even if it's private. Uh, use the correct secrets manager. So I'm trying to get back in the good books of HashiCorp. Vault, the best one, use it. Um, but there's different levels to this, right? So. Uh, if you're using something, a tool like Vault, this is a very, very heavy tool that's going to require people to manage it. It's going to require training of your staff to use it, but it is the best. But the problem that I always see is that sometimes people will have enthusiastic uh, people in the security team that will want to implement something like this, but not have the correct ability to roll it out. So then it doesn't get used, and then it becomes pointless. So then if you go down, there's dedicated secrets managers, like run SAS tools, a key list, Doppler, pass, 1Password has some great tools out there as, uh, as well for developers for managing secrets. Uh, short of that, you can use the secrets managers on your cloud infrastructure. And short of that, you can encrypt them and put them in your Git. Don't do the last one. It's a bad idea. Um, but the other ones you can all do. And what I like to stress is that, you know, um, People always say that you should aim for the top, and you should aim for the top, but that doesn't necessarily mean you should go there straight away. You've got to make sure that people are actually using them. Because uh, my gripe is, a, is that before we have the argument of what secrets manager is the best, 
let's stop committing our secrets in Git. Let's start there. And if whatever, whatever tool is going to help us do that, it's going to be easy to adopt, we can work it towards going up later. Uh, um, use automated secrets detection. This is my quick plug. So I work for Git Guardian, so we have automated secrets detection and tools. We have some open source tools. I use GG Shield a lot. And if you don't trust me and you don't, uh, uh, there's some other tools, the other open source tools that you can look. Basically, there's no excuse not to have secrets detection. It's somewhere in your, in your process. There's plenty of tools that are open source that can help you do that. Because that's what I'm going to be using to try and find your secrets. So you should be doing the same thing that I'm going to be doing as an attacker. Git hooks are a great way to actually stop the bleeding um, and rotate regularly. Limit privileges and whitelist services. So the one I'll talk about a lot, just rotate regularly. You should absolutely be rotating your keys regularly. There's two reasons for this. One obvious one is that if I find them, hopefully they're invalid. Two, it means that you know how to rotate them. So if you have a breach, you actually know what to do. The amount of times that people have a breach and they'll, they'll uncover that they actually keys have leaked, the attackers have access to them, and no one knows what they do. And if you revote it, is that going to crash production? So if you're rotating regularly, then you have to know what the keys do because you're rotating them. Limit your privileges. If, if, if the amount of times I see admin keys being, uh, being used for read-only, um, you should never have admin keys for anything other than admin level stuff. And whitelist services, make sure that only certain machines can connect. I'm over time by one minute. Uh, here's some, uh, some research if you're interested. If you want to learn more about how to securely manage secrets, there's the maturity model. And if you want to learn more about the research that I've presented, there's the state of secrets for all uh, are there. So thank you so much for your time. I hope it was an enjoyable session for you. And uh, I'll see you in the bar in a minute. Yeah, we have, you have time for questions? Yep. yep. Perfect. Um, first one comment. I know that you work for uh, Git Guardian, but also GitHub has built in secret scanning as part of GitHub's GitHub Advanced Security. Yeah. So built into their platform. The other question. Um, it, costs, it, costs you, a lot, it costs a lot of money. It does cost a lot of money. No, you're not wrong. Yeah, it's a very expensive product. Um, thankfully, I'm open small. All the stuff I work on is open source, so I get it for free for all that stuff. But yeah. yeah. Um, given that these keys are just falling out of these APK files. I know this is maybe not a question for you because you might not have the answer, but supposedly both Apple and Google are doing auditing of these apps before they end up in the App Store. Do you have any insights as to why, as a part of the auditing that they're doing, they're not running these off-the-shelf tools to make sure that these credentials are not ending up in these apps before they get published on the app stores? Yeah, for sure. So, so secrets detection is actually uh, quite difficult to always get right. It's very hard to have like a high level of, of accuracy in there. So if you were going to block an app from going onto the app store, you know, for false positives, that will create a lot of friction uh, to be able to do that. Um, so there, there, that that is absolutely why. What the auditing looks like from the app is that you know, is this doing anything malicious? Uh, is is data being sent into to weird places? Are you following our procedures? Um, it's interesting because this brings up the shared responsibility model. So uh, the shared security responsibility model is that. Vendors and security people and organizations should all bear some responsibility. So what you're kind of saying is that Apple and, 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 and the Play Store should have some responsibility for, for, for secrets. And I agree. But that's a very hard conversation to convince them to do it. There are some companies that I want to give a shout out to that are adopting this shared responsibility model really well. One of them is AWS. If you leak an AWS key on GitHub, uh, like I did today, uh, AWS will actually quarantine that key for you and let you know that you've leaked it. That is a great, that is a great step that AWS took to be able to do that properly. Uh, Twilio also does that as well. So um, there are some companies that are bearing a responsibility. Um, GitHub is obviously scared, like, adds free secret scanning for, for open source, but they also have an invested interest in selling that, like I do. So, you know, no, right, we'll, we'll, we'll battle about this later. Uh, but yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Speaking of which, can we get a look at your uh, AWS Honey Secrets and see how oh, it's yeah, doing? Oh yeah, sure. Sorry, I forgot. And by the way, thank you. Great talk. Uh, okay, so we have, uh, uh, we have uh, nine requests coming from here uh, at the moment. So quite, quite a lot of activity uh, from here. They're all using the Git caller ID. Uh, and there's a few different IP addresses, but some of them so here I see it too. So I think there's probably a couple of different actors uh, in here. One from India and then some other ones that we are unknown of where they're coming from. So nine. Nine is what we've got. <laughs> Which is not bad for 20 minutes. 
you just some, uh, inspired some really terrible ideas. Scan like, the app store, take all the secrets out, check them into a Git repository on GitHub, and then GitHub would then tell Git that would then have AWS revoke the, revoke the secrets on them. Yep, yep, for AWS. <laughs> it's, like, it's like you know, re revocation is a service via GitHub. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Um, have, I guess, have, have you guys or uh, do you know of any projects to um, kind of implement a GG Shield type uh, scanning within um, repo uh, or Docker container like like a SNC type like, scanning? Like, like doing it automatically, like, yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. No, we don't know anything else. So at, at Gagarin, we've been scanning public Git repositories for like seven years. Uh, we're, we're interested in doing um, the same for Docker, but the problem is, is that what we're scanning in GitHub is uh, is a is a is a diff. It's a it's a small segment of code. What we're scanning each time, so we can do it. Now, if we wanted to scan Docker images, we're going to have to pull those Docker images, which can be very large. Um, so it's a lot harder. If there was some way that we could just see, like, because and that's every time you update a Docker image. If there was some way that we could see what's you know the diff of the Docker image, that would be much easier. So it's a, it's a challenging problem because the Docker images are so large. Oh, that's fair. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's, there's, uh, th there's definitely ways to do it, um, uh, but, but it's just kind of about having the resources to do that, you know. And that's, and that's probably similar with the App Store uh, comments as well. I mean, these are very big files. You've got tens of millions of them. It takes resources to be able to scan them, so it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, but you know, the bad guys don't care, so, <laughs> so we have the time. Uh, th they have the time. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you all so much. Thank you, Mackenzie. Thanks, everyone.